welcome to a very special episode of Back Chat, powered by Fleet Network, of course, Dan. That's right. Um, look, I've been wanting to chat to this man for a long time, but a few years with him, but he's one of the one of the greats of the game, nay, West Coast, you know, yep. West Coast legend, the man that sits in front of us today, David Wirapunda. How are you, mate? It's a pleasure to be here. How right. are you, Dan? Very good. Thanks How for coming. How are you? I'm going well. Now that I've come into this magnificent studio, I feel a lot better about right. myself. So, uh, yeah, everything's going well. Good. Now, Pleasure I know – well, I'm not sure if you're a big fan of back chat, and I assume you are, but the first question we ask every guest is the same, Wira. Yeah, okay. Right? So we ask – so so you, you see this cricket trophy here. Yeah. We, we ask everyone – you know, we, we know you've played – over 200 games to West Coast Eagles. You're a premiership player. You're an All-Australian. We know you can play football. We've seen that ponytail blowing in the breeze, mate. We know you can <laughs> kick a torp. We know you can do things on a footy field. But I want to know your greatest sporting achievement not on the football field. We know all about you. We, we, and we're going to get right into your footy stuff, right? But we want to know what, you, what your greatest sporting achievement is not on the football field. Dan, you might mm. be thinking, like, what's Dan ever done? Well, a lot of things. Tell him, tell uh, him. I mean, I could, li- I don't know where to start really, but we'll start at the cricket ball because that's what Scoy brought up. Uh, five for 16 in a grand final, bowling leg spinners um, to under 12s. I was 12 as well. I wasn't. I was going to say, I, was, I hope so. <laughs> it, was, it was last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we lost that grand final, unfortunately. Um, but that's probably the greatest thing I've ever done. On that's a pretty big effort. Yeah. What, what, yeah, what have you done yeah. off the football? Mine field? is uh, ninety-five. I played next uh, mixed netball at Hillsville wow. and uh, got up, won the premiership in that. And I thought, played wing attack. I thought, Jesus, this is this is it for me? <laughs> <laughs> mixed netball. <laughs> yeah, mixed. Net, that's that's one of the only things. And also uh, basketball. For um, I played for the Dandenong Rangers. Oh, uh, so I had a, I had an aspiration to play basketball back in Victoria. Uh, so those are probably the main two things that I remember I like that. vividly as a young bloke. Did you get basketball a- town, Dan, did Yeah, yeah. Well, they were, we were kind of in the mix with the start of, remember, Melbourne Magic? So we were yes. in that, in that yeah, squad right. as young kids out at uh, uh, North Ringwood. Uh, so that was my transition, trying to get into the basketball scene. And then footy kind of came along really quickly and I thought, well, they look like they pay you a little bit more, so I'm going to go that way. Yeah. So, I mean, if we if we talk about – I've got a couple of other questions we've been asking off the top, but I want to ask about growing up um, – yeah, you brought up in Shepparton, you're a Victorian. Yep. Hey, a couple yep. of Victorians on the so podcast. Country, country boys, time. yeah. Uh, <laughs> did, did, you, did you kick 32 goals in the game of – Footy as a school kid, I did. Uh, that was for <laughs> thirty-two. Par- yeah, that was for Parkmore. A lot of people will think that I'm making that up, but it's actually quite true. <laughs> Is that even possible? <laughs> well, it was against the team that we were playing, so uh, that was that was uh, Parkmore Primary School. Um, so that was when I was kind of wanting to take it a little bit more seriously. So. Yeah, there was, a lot of com- a there was a lot of complaints going on that uh, I wasn't sharing the ball. And <laughs> I remember, course, the, I remember the umpire checking my hand for glue. I said, <laughs> come on, mate, this, you've been an idiot. So, yeah, that, that's uh, that's one of my fond memories. I kicked 17 for, uh, in, up in Shepparton as well. So I, I wanted to try and keep that process going. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. What was your what was your first car? You remember your first car? Was it here or back in Victoria? Uh, well, it was a Nissan Pulsar that uh, Cuzzy and I got signed in our uh, sign-on fee for the first time that we signed for West Coast. Did you? So good. And it was so weird because a whole year went before I was driving back and forth to training. I got a five-bedroom house in Scarborough. The Eagles got me set up in because I never got billeted out because I didn't want to. Because if I went with a family, I would have thought, well, I thought to myself at the time, it would have made me more homesick. Yeah. So I thought, see if I can get through this by myself, I should be okay. But I also got my licence. And um, a good mate of mine who's just who was running the Perth Licensing Centre uh, got me in there. His best mate was Chrissy Lewis, and Louis taking me in there. He goes, "You got to give the young bloke uh, his license." Drove me around the block, giving it to me, and didn't realise that I was sixteen. <laughs> so for a whole year, I was driving around in a Nissan Pulsar, living by myself. And Mick Mouldhouse goes, "How's this bloke getting a trainer?" <laughs> And uh, I've got the old pulsar at the front. I didn't think anything wrong was wrong with it, so uh, I got got in pretty big, big trouble. But I was basically driving around Perth as a sixteen year old in my own car, and it was against the law. Living in a Scarborough mansion, pretty much. <laughs> Still eating wheat mix, but <laughs> oh, that's very good. So, like, I mean, the, the whole the whole thing is you know, youngest ever player to. Played for West Coast, 16 years and how many days, I'm not quite sure. 290 or something. I remember you when we played together. There, there was some debate about the birth certificate. 
Do, 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 do we know how old you are? Do you know how old well, you are? Well, this rumour eventuated very early because when I played for Vic Metro against Western Australia and Cuzzy was the captain, we kind of met each other then and there, he started that rumour because <laughs> when we went to um, – because I wasn't a draft pick, I was a compensation pick. There was two of us in the AFL and that was Matthew Lloyd. Matthew Lloyd went to Western and I went to West Coast. So there's all this debacle about where these young blokes are going. Um, but apparently I've been playing senior footy since I was 12 <laughs> and I can't work out how old I was, which I was because I was playing in a lot of different leagues in Victoria under different names. So I quickly got caught out. What do you mean? Well, I was playing in the Yarra Valley. I was playing in the EDFL. I was playing over in Dandenong, uh, Frankston. So I was playing in all these different leagues, getting paid under different names, under different ages. What were some of your names? Sean Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Jade Matheson. Uh, Jade Matheson. Dale Cracker. <laughs> I was just trying to think of all these blackfella names and amalgamate them all together that never belonged to Victoria, so I thought this is the only way I can get out of this. Um, so I got caught out pretty quickly. The only way that honesty came into my football career is when I had to sign with the Eastern Rangers. So right. that's, that's the way it all kind of ha- came about. What was your first job? You remember your first job? My first job, I started a lawn mowing. My brother had a lawn mowing uh, business <laughs> and he sacked me pretty quick because I was mowing all the elderly people's lawns for free because I, they had no one doing it. So you can't do that. And I pretty much got sacked, but I told him where to stick it anyway. <laughs> um, so that was my first real job. Um, but I did work experience with uh, uh, at AFL House in 94. Did you? Uh, with uh, and my two bosses was Gavin Brown and, and Gary Lyon. That's when Auskick started. So I, I took that opportunity to go all the way from Hillsville to AFL House every second day and all I did was do whatever Gary Lyon and <laughs> Gavin, uh, Gavin Brown told me, which was exciting because we didn't – that's now Auskick. Yeah, So that, cool. we were just growing the game in the AFL and I was the first young – person to get a job there f- and also do schooling. So that's why I got myself in the AFL house. Do, do you remember Do you remember sort of your upbringing and your childhood and, and your younger days? Like what, what are your memories of, of, of growing up? Oh, it was pretty pretty <coughs> diverse. I mean, my father's from northeast of Arnhem Land in Northern Territory, so I was brought up in a very cultural uh, lifestyle. When I say cultural, I mean really cultural. There's my Family on my father's side don't speak English. English is right. their second language. Right. Uh, so I've spent most of my life up there in Arnhem Land, uh, learned all their customs. The most important thing to me is my, you know, my culture and heritage. Then I came down to Victoria where my mother, mother's uh, from Shepparton, uh, from the Mission Cumbra um, and that's where I learned all the political side of things um, because they're very politically savvy. My family from a mother's side started the first Aboriginal college. Uh, uncle Doug Nichols is very famous. He's, he's my uncle. Um, so we had very influential Indigenous people in Victoria that were very – were the benchmark of Aboriginal affairs. So I had a good mixture of both. So mm. I was pretty lucky as a kid um, and I moved around a lot and uh, that's seen a lot of the country. And, but mainly just seeing the, the background of what they achieved was absolutely magnificent. Have you been able to pass that like through generation, like to your kids? Yeah, well, it's it, it's important as part of being a you know natural parent, but just reminding them on where they come from is very important to me as well. But utilizing sport was such an important thing for us and my family back in the old days to make that presence mm. uh, politically. So um, yeah, when you're from Victoria, as you know, all, all of my Koori family are very influential. From my father's side, they, uh, my dad and um, his brother started the biggest band in, in the world at one stage called You're the Indy. So they were, oh. if I wasn't an AFL player, I would have been travelling around Europe playing the Yiraki or the Didgeridoo <laughs> with my family, but I think I chose the wrong one when I look at it all. <laughs> I was going to say, which one did you <laughs> What want am I do? doing here, mate? <laughs> Jeez, I shot myself in the foot there, haven't I? Thank you for your career to chat off that <laughs> yeah. chat, mate. You could have been in your the end. Uh, so you drafted in 95, uh, get to the footy club. What's that process like? You know, the, I've, I've read sort of trip that Niz, Niz had a bit to getting you over and recruiting you. Is that is that how you? Recruit? Yeah, well, it was uh, back in them days. Nizzy, uh, Brian Cook, uh, the great Brian Cook, had yeah. a, he's very influential. Even today he's very um, – 
very special to me and close to me and Mick. So they they were they kind of come out of the blue because when I kind of started getting attention through the under 18s uh, at Eastern Rangers, um, the compensation picks were still in. So when Fremantle came in as a new franchise, they were looking for new players and they had those younger picks. Um, hence why. Lloyd and myself were looking to go to Fremantle. Um, Stephen Tinge was supposed to leave Melbourne to come to Fremantle. And then the big one, I went and trained with Nikki. Remember Nikki Winmar picking me up? I was that. I was I was crying. <laughs> really? So I went and trained with the Saints uh, for about a month. Why, because, why did Nikki come and pick you up his car? Yeah, come and pick me up. Oh. And I was just, oh, oh, mate, he made my nipples go hard. <laughs> So when he rocked up, I was training at with St Kilda at Moorabbin and um, that that deal was fell through as well because Stewie Lowe was supposed to come to Fremantle. Hence why I went to Melbourne uh, because Stephen Tinge was meant to do the swap for the 16-year-old and then we all went to Fremantle to train and then um, – that's yeah. That's right. the way it all kind of unfolded. Right. Freer fans listening would have been like, we could have had Matty Lloyd. Yeah, well, so then West Coast are just yeah, exactly. Like West Coast <laughs> just jump jump on you then. Yeah, well, yeah. What, well, at that time uh, they were really keen on Michael Gardner. Uh, they came and met me uh, over home in Victoria, and I said, well, why don't you stay with Michael Gardner, Western Australian product? And I actually used to watch Gardy play in the juniors and also for Claremont. So I thought this bloke's going places. And he's a key position player. Why do they want me? <laughs> um, and that's the way it all kind of unfolded. So they ended up swapping Ian Downsborough to Port Adelaide from West Coast, which gave them the second pick, the second year for Michael Gardner, and they gave to- uh, uh, Tony Godden and David Irons to Fremantle for, for me huh. wow. and Phil Matera. So did you arrive at the club with a ponytail? I did. I, I arrived with... Uh, Oh, geez, I was I was never an Eagle supporter and I had mixed emotions about it being a Victorian because I remember going to uh, Moorabbin and the MCG to go and watch the Eagles play, who's this new team, and, and I just remember them coming out like they've been, you know, been surfing all week. They've all come out bronzed, <laughs> you know. We just thought, geez, who are these blokes? And I just remember uh, watching Chris Mainwaring run around and, and Dean Kemp and – they made names and an impact really quickly. Um, and the only bloke that I used to hate the most was Wooshy because he was belting all, the, all of our Victorians. <laughs> but thinking, who's this smart-ass bloke throwing his weight around? So little did I know I was going to be the, be a part of their team. And, and when I walked in, they were the first to greet me and I thought I felt at home straight away. Yeah, who'd, you go, who'd you go for then? I was Mad Hawthorne. Right. I was Mad Hawk and I wore number 44 in honour of my um, hero, Johnny Platten. So did you get to pick 44 when you got to the club or? No, I didn't. It was just sitting there and um, it was really weird because I had uh, 44 sitting there and 35 and I was wondering who that was and that's when Cuzzy walks in and he goes, oh, well, that's my number. So I said, well, I'll stick with this and you stick there and that's the way we kind of started off. What's it like meeting Wusha for the first time? I was scared when I Yeah, I was intimidated, mate. He was this big barrel-chested bloke um, and some stories I can tell you about him. He... um, he, he was very scary, mate. So, you know, we heard all these rumours about his, um, you know, his, his, I suppose his character change and I didn't believe it. But after getting to know, you know, the other players more often, I think Chrissy Lewis made it worse for me because uh, he just told me stories that were half true and half <laughs> Lies Love about life. this bloke turning into Hulk. Can you remember? Any? Oh, mate, the first one I can tell you the, my first experience at West Coast. Mick Modhouse said, "Okay, it's a derby," and I said, "Well, what's a derby? <laughs> we we have a derby every week in Melbourne. Yeah, we have yeah. we have the best teams play, and that's that's the beauty about being a Victorian. Coming over is the first derby. Mick Modhouse goes, "I want you to sit on the uh, bench and watch the way we do the rotations, and I want want you to watch." The, these type of players in particular it was Peter Matera and Guy McKenna. And uh, I sat down, I was excited. I've got my, I was more happy that I've actually got an AFL tracksuit on. As soon as I had an AFL tracksuit, I knew that I made it. <laughs> so I'm sitting there just looking around, embracing this new game of, of between these two Western Australian sides. Now, my first experience to John, he wasn't supposed to play. So he's, he's got a jab in his ankle from old Billy. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting there sucking in 
all this, the environment of this AFL team and just watching their preparation unfold and it was unreal. Um, and uh, I've gone on the bench, the siren's gone. So Guy McKenna was getting the runaround by uh, Winston Abraham. No one play, no one <laughs> kicks goals on, on uh, Bluey that quick. Anyway, you kick three uh, and you can hear Mickey, you didn't need the phone because <laughs> you can open the window and you hear him swearing, <laughs> get him off, get Wusher on. And what Wusher said to me, Scared the living shit out of me because as he's taking his – unzipping his jacket, it's like watching Superman just undress and he's put his hand on my on my leg and he goes, son, what I'm about to do doesn't mean that I don't like black fellas. <laughs> and I felt like running to the boundary line and telling every black fellow on that ground to fucking run <laughs> or tell Winston Abraham, run for your life. <laughs> do it for your people. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put it, put it this way, that was Winnie's last uh, last few touches of the game because uh, he got – Wusha went out there and belted the shit out of him. <laughs> oh, that is good, mate. Very good. Um, so that's in like 95, 96, somewhere there? That was, that was 96. So 96. In your first few years at the club, you don't play, you don't play every game. You, you, you're struggling a bit. And do you, do you, doesn't Mick sit you down at some stage and sort of – you know, put it to you a bit. Yeah, no, he gave me a good, a good talking to. He was kind of. It was hard them days because footy wasn't full time. Um, so I've got. I'm a 16 year old kid. The only thing I know is to be a 16 year old kid. So I'm sitting in this five bedroom house by myself in Scarborough, <laughs> and they're wondering why it was traumatizing the first three years. Is because you know you didn't have the full support there that they have today. Yeah. Um, so I, I struggled the first three years and I was wondering why I was struggling to get through each game and this is just at East Perth. And then I got probably a reputation at East Perth saying this boy's just useless, he can't get through an AFL game. It's not just his feet, he's just running out of steam. It's because I wasn't eating. All I was right. doing was sitting by myself. I, I would eat wheat bix religiously and, and I thought drinking Powerade would compensate all the food that I'm missing out on. <laughs> so, and I wasn't sociable. I kind of locked my, myself away for three years wow. and that's what made it hard. So until I started to uh, involve myself with Wusha more, more often, uh, Peter Matera, I would start to go to their places only because I wanted to eat. <laughs> and then once I started to get that right, I was, I was able to get through training and, um, and playing. So that's, that's how hard it was. And then Mick came past and said, look, we're looking at trading you to St Kilda do you want to go home? And I said, oh, not really because I feel like I haven't given enough. Right. So that's why I said no and that was at the end of 98. So that was 98 and you go on to play pretty much every game post that really, I mean. From 99 onwards, yeah. yeah. Mm. And that's all it was. It was, it was, a, it was a good stern speaking to you. It, was, it wasn't nice. Uh, it was very straight down the line and this is what I, I, I appreciate that to this day. Um, of how he went about that. <clears throat> and it wasn't just him, it was Robert Wiley. Robert Wiley gave me a good ass kicking as well. Uh, Dean Kemp, all my mentors really pushed me. Um, Dean Kemp was was probably the main one who rode me like black caviar. He hit me hard because he always said, you don't depend on your on your ability, it, it's, you got to put in some hard work. So uh, Tommy Kemp, he uh, kicked my ass. That was the message you – I always remember, you know, you're, you're always very tight with the you know, interstate boys. So me as a young kid coming to the footy club, we were as a senior player and you used to speak about that a lot. But it, does, it doesn't sound like you always had that. It was something you had to learn, right, <clears throat> that hard work, that – even the social – like the socialising. And like, Is that yeah. something that you really had to – Yeah, I struggled. Yourself? I struggled. It was, it was really um, – it, it was one of the difficult things I, I had to push myself through. It wasn't just the training aspect. It was about socialising with – with your teammates and being a part of a family. Um, but with the three years, I actually thought that I was going to be like a Peter Matera and just have that ability and just walk through. But then I seen how hard Peter works. Uh, then I seen how hard everyone works. And and that was something that um, I, it took me a good four years to really, really change my mindset in that. Um, and one of the focuses then is that I wanted to try and be the best trainer uh, while we're training. I wanted to be the best that I can be and be an example where I was very blasé the first three or four years and uh, I'm going to get a game regardless. Well, that, that all changed and if it wasn't for uh, Tommy Cam. The other one as well is watching the 
the way Brawny, Michael Braun started to really change his work ethic. Cuzzy was always the benchmark and he used to get pissed off with me in a lot of turns because he, he thought I wasn't hungry enough, um, which all those internal challenges pushed me to, to, to hold my place and do my job, mm. really. Did you sort of take that on later on in your career when you saw younger guys, like with the social aspect and stuff and, and, and making sure that that was important for, for them as well? Yeah, I was a little bit more open-minded with that because, I mean, Scully's position coming from, you know, Victoria and Geelong, I understand what he's feeling and what he's going through. So I, I wouldn't push as hard mm. uh, to be a part of that social network straight away, um, but just more so understanding the environment of the expectations from the club and the players and not only internally as a footballer, that's what you have to do outside that kind of is going to help you as well. So that was that was something that I was a little bit more lenient with. But as I become more of a senior player, I, I just wanted to be a lot more gentle on delivering because I know that it could either make or break a person as well. Were you close to Mick, Mick Malthouse? Was yeah. He, was it, like people say father figure. Yeah. Is that – yeah, if anything, too much of a father figure, mm. um, even to this day. Uh, but he was really close. But he had he had an obligation. He made a promise to my grandmother and my mother that he was going to be because I never had a father. So he said he's going to take over that role. And being in WA, you don't know no one. So that relationship grew more so as a father than than a coach. And that's what kind of interrupted my relationship with him at the club because I didn't want that. I wanted to be like every other player and and have the same expectations from him to a player where he used to give me a little bit of leniency for that and I did want to be favoured. Did, 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 was it was it tough or a good thing when he left, like for your, for your footy? Well, <coughs> was that too, too, no, too soft? it was because I was a part of the package deal when he was leaving. So there was myself, Chad Morrison and Michael Braun, uh, all packaged to go to Collingwood. And uh, I remember having a chat to, uh, to Brawny about this and I said, mate, you know, I think we should make our own way and stick with the club. And we can always go home, but um, if we go home, our mindset will be different as far as preparation. Footy would not be my priority if I went home; it'd be family. Mm. So that's why we decided to stay. Um, and we tried to convince Chatty Morrison about it, but he's a little bit lenient for to go home. Um, but that was our decision, and that was a good thing. I think when Mick left, we kind of we grew as footballers. You know, we were all of a sudden struggling to get into uh, pushing to be all Australian. Mm-hmm. You know? So that was a, a good thing for us. Do you have any – like Mick could spray, couldn't he? Like, oh. do, you have, oh. do you have any memories of good – My favourite memory is when he used when he went off his head at Phil Matera on the bench and I'm going, yes, give him more, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> Phil needs this more than me. <laughs> but he, he's gone off. Um, he's – I remember he's – he, when it was so intense, if we would lose, he would always go to his best players and really, really hang them out to dry. And um, we didn't want to be in that position as young blokes. We, we, we just used to watch Ashley McIntosh, Peter Matera, you know, Tommy Kemp, Brett Hetty, let them get the blame. Um, but because their expectations of playing consistently well for us and representing us, we then knew what that felt like years down the track. Yes. It's like a badge yeah. of honour. If, if it is like if he's, if he's going at you, yeah. well, you know, yeah, that's respect. Mm. So Ken Judge comes in and coaches for a couple of years and then Woosha, your old teammate, yeah. you know, your captain, comes back and is coaching you. Like, what's, that, what's that like playing under a former teammate? <clears throat> it, was, it was really um, I knew John had that capability of coming back. Um, I think in that tenure of – of uh, Judgy coming in, and I really respect and love Judgy because Judgy's seen leadership in me where he put me in a position to be a vice captain, and I didn't really see that in myself at the time, but he pushed me in a lot of different areas as well, <clears throat> and um, I appreciated that of the great man, bless his soul. Um, and obviously it didn't work out as time went on, um, and I knew deep down inside that there was a target there for Wusha when he went to when he went to Carlton. Um, so there were always these worst kept secrets and meetings behind the scene that everyone knows about. But once Wusha came back, it was a, it was like a breath of fresh air again because we we know that the culture of that football club was based around a lot of his own ethics, um, and we knew that what his capabilities were. I knew as 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 someone who played underneath him as a friend, 
Um, I, I know what his capabilities are. Sometimes it's always scared to get one of your great players back as a coach. It didn't, doesn't always work out for a lot of um, champion players, but Wush's dedication, as you know, his he's concept on football is, is pretty unique. Hmm. Was it... Did he treat you any differently? Like, did he give it, you harsher treatment because you were mates? If anything, I found that his expectations on me was a lot higher than I thought, um, which I kind of had to learn how to embrace that pressure. Um, and one of the things that I took out of Guy McKenna's book is the only way that you can kind of loosen this man up is just using humour all the time. So that's one of the things that I've learnt with <laughs> to control people like John Warsfold. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'll be running quicker than Winston Abraham <laughs> out of that stadium. <laughs> did you did you ever cop any sprays that you felt oh, plenty. from from Wusher? Yeah, that plenty. You felt but a bit rough he from? he had he he used to get me on a one on one basis and. Um, and when he questions me about uh, my commitment, that's what used to piss me off a lot, but that's what, how he would get me back on track. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of um, meetings that were there were no jokes or laughing matters in there. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's very frank, but afterwards he has always given you a kiss and cuddle. So, all right, so you're a backman. Let's just not let's not bet around the bush here, but you, you kicked 141 goals across your career with. So was that just you – Taking some liberties and going yeah, for a trot down the ground. Risk. Yeah, well, I remember sitting down asking, um, you know, uh, greats like Andrew McLeod and Gavin Wanganoon, who I used to kind of aspire to try and play and rebound like them. Um, and there was myself, Byron Pickett, and we were all in uh, at this Indigenous camp. I said to Byron, I said, because Byron and I used to compete against each other for the most bounces and rebounds from 50. So every, Actually or? Actually, yeah. We were better at each other. <laughs> and um, and we checked the, the footy record um, before we go out. And he, I said, oh, geez, he's about seven bounces up or four clearances bigger. So we would stay in contact. But we would go to Gavin Wanganeen and, and Andrew McLeod and ask him how they would play in their mindset. You're never going to be in their league, but to think how they think, you could take it out. Um, and one thing that I suppose Gavin always said to me, he goes, why man up if you've got the footy in your hand? Um, and he goes, just keep going down and having shots on goals. <laughs> so that's what all I just remember doing. So I thought every opportunity I'm going to get, I'll sneak down. I remember sneaking down there without the coach's permission. He goes, what is fucking we're doing on the <laughs> half forward flank? <laughs> just trying to sneak a couple in and I'm just checking the stats and say, well, I need a couple more goals this year. So try and get it up and about. <laughs> when, when did you start taking kick-ins? Was that early? Or? Yeah, it was early. It was quite early. So it was around 99 um, where Bluey McKenna kind of made me responsible and that was traumatising to me. That was, as you know, Sco, it's, oh, yeah. it's one of the hardest jobs it's in It's not where you want to be. So <laughs> it's, it's – Unless it, you can kick him like you. Well, that's why I started doing torpedoes because I didn't want the ball – the furthest point the ball is from me, <laughs> I'm doing my job. So Bluey started making me do that back in 99 and, and kind of continued on there until I got comfortable. And I didn't get comfortable until about 2003 or four. Wow. There's, there's yeah. a, a YouTube, um, you know, there's plenty of AFL highlights on YouTube, you know, marks and goals and, you know, runs down the wing and stuff. But I don't think any other player has a, I think it's almost three minute highlight package of just kick-ins. <laughs> this is I've, never, I've, I've never seen it. So <laughs> it's good. I, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was one of those things where it was, um, well, I used to listen to Peter Matera a lot. So if I was nervous and you may watch some of the kick-ins, I'd always make Rue Matera sit in the, pocket next to me because I need him to keep talking to me. <laughs> so he was my little, you know, my little head in the voice in my head. Really? Uh, and if I wasn't overly confident, I'll just look at him and he'll just jog over and pick it up and put his cigarette down and kick it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that oh, – look, is this, is this urban legend? Is this true? Is, was there – you don't have to name if you don't want to. Was there boys having a quick dart? During games at so any it time. Wasn't a, a- it wasn't a quick dart. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> I mean, I was Peter Matera's, Scotty Cummings, I was their bitch <laughs> for fucking years. So I had to pick him up, take him to the airport, prepare everything, half time before the game, and that's that's a few puffs, put it that way. So, so cigarettes during the game? Yeah, there was a few times, yeah. <laughs> Jeepers. And uh, one of that it happen these days? No way. You get no. It's everyone's more worried about getting paid these days and, and risking it. But yeah, that was what used to happen back in the early days. And 
I was quite shocked from it because we were still in transition of going from just part-time to full-time professional athletes. And then you've got some of the superstars sitting there having a having a, having a fag. <laughs> and I used to turn the showers up full ball to hide the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Steam. Yeah. Um, with the kick-ins, you used to like, – because you, you don't kick it to yourself anymore for the, for the run-out. Do you think that's like a lost art, the, the kick to yourself before you can leave the square? You would cost yourself a few kicks. Yeah, sure, yeah. well, you can get yourself stats up a bit depending on how you feel. But um, I see the Dacos boys do it a fair bit as well. But it's – you know, if you, I reckon to play on, you don't have the Dean Cox of the world really roaming around at the back to hit. You need that distance. Mm. Um, but it's a confidence thing as well, playing that boundary line or going straight up. But I don't see it a lot as, as much as we used to. Do you remember the first time you just pulled a torp out and just – would you have had to ask permission back then? Yeah, I had to do I had to do ten torpedoes at training to Wusha uh, to get the okay because I asked him, you know, if we've got Judd Kerr Cousins uh, Cox Embley, why am I going short? I said, why can't we just play school footy and, and let them have the problem? So he said, show me just ten torpedoes in a row and you can see how it goes in the game. And I got on the one. And at the back was Juddy and Curry, and they had one bounce and had a shot on goal. So I just looked up and said, "Let's keep this game plan going." You don't have to. It's it's very simple. Yeah, it's common sense. So um, we don't see, do not see. I can't remember no. the last time I saw someone kick a talk in a game. Yeah, I, I know. Lost it, it, it's it's gone up and down. We, we went through a phase there for a few years when I kind of kept doing it in 04, 05, 06, 07. There was a few other players doing it. I remember Lindsay Gilby having a chat with him. I said, mate, you're skillful enough. Just get onto it and let the boys, you know, run onto it. So, And he was very skillful, Lindsay, so he, he started it. I remember, like, being at games and the crowd just audibly gasping. Like, you'd see it floating. It's like it's still going. Like, the people used to love it. How did you used to kick him so far? You're not, you're not a big man. No. You don't have any muscle on your legs. No. How did you st- – like, in genuine question. Like, we see Quinton Lynch. You could kick bigger than him and he's – 195 centimetres, 120 kilos. Each leg, yeah. It was, uh, well, it was, I reckon it was just a lot of my glute training and my ass. Because, <laughs> like, like uh, I remember I remember I did one out to Tommy Dean Kemp and uh, he, he said at quarter time and he's staring at my legs, he goes, you've got, they're the back of the shins, you've got no calves, you've got nothing. <laughs> he goes, and you've launched it. Uh, and it was just more, more so timing, you yeah. know, it's just timing. It's like golf, just a gentle swing and. Let the, let the ball do the rest. So what about um, when you're you know, playing early days when Freo come into the competition, those early derbies? We've just seen a derby here in um, in Perth at Optus Stadium. What, what were your memories of those sorts of matchups against, you know, Freo? You spoke about Woosha with Winnie, but, you know, what, what about you playing in them and the, the feeling out, out in the field? Yeah, it was pretty intense. I didn't really get caught up into it a lot. Um, is that a Victorian thing? Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I couldn't really care less about it, to be honest, because, like I said, we the derby for us over in Vic, we get one every week. So the the mindset for me was a bit different. Um, the intensity for everyone else kind of always grew a leg. To me, it has to be consistent. Um, and playing on players, you, you kind of see around town here a lot anyways, and I had a lot of relationships. Well, playing on Troy Cook and... Brad Witterer and all those type of blokes. We had a lot of social – and Dale Kickett, they all, we all worked together. Yeah. So to me it was like, oh, we're just going to go and have a kick against your mates. But <laughs> um, I remember saying to Troy Cook, I said, if you keep belting me around, I'll dock your pay on Monday. So, <laughs> uh, he pulled he pulled back pretty quickly. He hit pretty hard. Yeah. Cookie, yeah, he did. You know, Cookie was pretty hard in the midfield. And I remember his transition coming back from Sydney, we almost had him. Um, at right. West Coast, but one of the things that the club really made a decision on is building their back six, and that's where Chicky came into play, which yes. um, I think was probably the better move in the at the end of the day. Do you remember that first loss to Frio, like the first time that Frio ever won? Oh yeah, because well, it was their grand final. Yeah, right. you know, the, the, the whole year stopped for them. That was in '99. <laughs> I remember Brad Weir tagging me out of the back line and. He stuck two on me and I kicked one and we all called it a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the demolition derby? You, you didn't play in that game, but you would have been sitting on the sidelines. I, I heard a, a – well, I read something that uh, apparently Peter Sumich 
had leaked to the playing group that Freo were going to come in and try beat you guys up. No, they're always going to try that, anyways. I mean, one of the things that kind of started it is our good mate old um, <laughs> Phil Reed. I said to Reedy because I, I finished work that day and I knew I wasn't playing and that work, this is when I was working at the Wirra Foundation and I've got the boys in and it's a bit awkward that day because you're all eyeing each, eyeing each other off asking questions. Oh, who are you playing? I said, oh, I've got Sanderlands today. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, just throwing as many lies as you possibly can around. But that day I actually knew that um, Dale Kickett had stress fractures in his back. And uh, I gave a little heads up at the beach room at Subi to Phil Reid. I said, whatever you do, don't touch his back. Just play him like you usually play him, tag him, wear him down. I said, but don't punch him in the back because he'll turn into a fucking monster. <laughs> so I think we've seen the end result in that. So Phil Reid touched his back. Oh, yeah, he's <laughs> punching into his back. And I'm in the stand going, you dickhead, I told you. I tried to warn you, my little brother. <laughs> So when he rocked up the next day and he had eyes blacker than mine, I thought, geez, I'm trying to tell you, man. But uh, that was a part of that and that's where the Demolition Derby is, is known for. And to this day, to Dale Kickett's credit, he, he's ashamed of that. Um, he's very apologetic, but he, he just that was the end of him as well. I mean, speaking about big moments in derbies, the 2001 bump on Shorty Mack, did, has he ever apologised to running into your shoulder? Uh, mate, we uh, we speak about this a lot, man, Shorty. Uh, I think his hair, his locks made it look worse. <laughs> but I remember, I remember, and this goes back to my Victorian days. So I remember the, the play unfolding in that moment. So I was sitting in the goal square and I remember Andrew Ship. Now, do you remember Andrew Ship? No, Dan's not name. Though. Yeah, I remember Yeah, well, Andrew Ship had it on the half forward flank and I played with Andrew Ship. Uh, against in, in the Yarra Valley. And I always known since he's a kid that he lobs the ball. He can't keep it down. <laughs> so I thought to myself, Shippy's got it. I can see Macca going on, the, on his right shoulder. I said, I reckon I'm quick enough to make where that ball is going to drop because he lobs it. And then as soon as I left my man, I knew exactly where it was and Shawnee Max jaw just happened to be there. Did you get reported for that? No. Wow. Shawnee Mack should have because he kicked the goal. <laughs> yeah, the worst skills in Australia and he kicks the goal. That goes down in Docker's folklore. I oh, know, mate. I oh, know. And the thing is, I actually walked up to him and gave him a cuddle to see if he was all right. And he goes, what happened? I said, you kicked the goal, you dickhead. <laughs> you make me look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bigger contract than him at the end of that year anyways. <laughs> People talk about Anthony Kudafidi's one-handed pick-up used to run around holding the ball, but I don't know if there's too many more iconic things than seeing the number 44 for West Coast run around scooping balls off the ground one-handed. Was that something you did as a kid? Was it something to do with your fingers? Yeah, it was more so to do because playing at Hillsville, we played a lot in the mud and, and the snow. So it was always wet weather footy, um, and that was just becoming a habit of learning how to play. Um and that was one thing that I wanted to implement in my game. And when I first came to West Coast, having a chat with uh, Peter, Peter always said to me, Peter Materia goes, you have to have something that the people will love. I said, what do you do? He goes, Aru just taps it out and they can't get me. I'll just dance around. He goes, what, he goes, what are you going to do? I said, well, I've got to pick the ball up then. I'll pick it, pick it up in the rain. And my mother always said, what's your mindset when the sun's out? How do you pick that ball up? I said, I pick it up flat out. She goes, what's your mindset when it's raining? She goes, don't change your mindset. Right. So that was something that I worked on pretty hard and it became natural in my game. I mentioned your fingers. You've got extraordinary long fingers, don't you, Wira? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about my memories of you around the footy club and there's some humour and giving, getting rubs from Billy Sutherland and one memory I used to have, young, 2007, <clears throat> first at the club, there's these ice bins, right? And so I gotta, I'm got to, i looking at blokes like where I've got to do everything there is to get up yep. and play in the back line with these guys. So every session I'd be in the ice bins and be sitting there and be shivering and be towel around me. <laughs> we were coming in, we are in a dressing gown. He'd walk all the way, he'd walk all the way, he's walking, he's going to get up. Great, I'll get to do an ice bin with Wira. He'd walk over to the edge and get his fingers <laughs> And dip his fingers into the <laughs> ice bins. Dip his fingers into the ice bins. Give him a little tinkle around. Maybe leave him there for thirty seconds. Yes, yeah, stretching it. And then you get him out. And you go, ah, that feels better. And then you'd walk back in your dressing gown, back to the change rooms. Recovery done. Are you still recovering like that, Will? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, 
I got into a lot of trouble about that, but um, as long as I got a kick, they didn't argue too much about it. But, yeah, ice bins did not do anything for me because um, of my skinny legs and feet and all that. It was just too much pain for me. <laughs> but I used to always tell them, I said, well, my feet have been made to uh, walk around the mangroves of Arnhem, eh? not to be running around on Subiaco Oval. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you had really flat feet. They're Don't remember. They're still here, mate. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like walking around with two stakes underneath a pair of ankles. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not the it's not the best thing in the world. They're flat, hey. I remember your footy flat. boots. They were like a couple of. They're piano all custom boards made. Yeah, there's no arch underneath them. They're really? all custom made. So that's that's what, why I had to um, get a pretty big sponsorship because I, I never ever wore normal footy boots. They were all made. Right. They're like, you know, like footy boots or runners and they've got the yeah, arch yeah, and they've the got the, the – where is the – it's just a <laughs> plank of wood and they'd have stocks. It actually, it actually looks like they're, they're, it's wrong, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's funny. <laughs> um, speaking of things that look wrong, the, the ochre Guernsey uh, behind us um, – which has Dave's signature. Has your signature on it. Mm. Someone someone actually very generously yes. sent that in to us and so now we hang it with with pride. It's, one, it's actually one of my favourites. It's like it's so bad that it's good. Yeah. Well that's, what did you guys think? That's why we thought it? as well. And I remember when we first got it, I, th- I think it was Kazi. Yeah, someone looks like it's spewed up on it. And we got to walk out <laughs> we got to walk out on that. And I said, Well, you're getting paid seven hundred for us, so shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, it was a bit weird. We had mixed emotions. Little did we know that was one of the highest selling jumpers at the time in the AFL. So And it's one of the most sought after now. Yeah, it is. And people mm. are after that. It's yeah, it's it's quite interesting. So mm. we got we got um Glenn Jakovic, teammate of yours. Yeah. Rowan yeah. Jones. Rowan Jones, now director of the West Coast Eagles. You used to like playing with him, didn't you? Everyone oh, did. I loved it. It was really weird. I mean, I speak about Jonesy a lot because he's probably the player that doesn't get the accolades as, as our superstars did, um, but always did the job that no one really did. He was so underrated, but he was our, the, our one of our best team players. Um, before, we get on to, well. before we get on to the – yeah, hair. correct. Still does have that hair. Um, before we get on to the grand final stuff, 05, 06, 2003, did you play in the International Rules Series? Uh, yes. Where was that? Was that the, overseas? No, that here? was here. Right. Yeah. Because I've heard some stories over in Ireland that perhaps the boys were yeah, play was, by day, I was quite happy. drink by night. Yeah, I was quite happy I didn't make that trip. So, <laughs> yeah. did, did, so you played in it? Yeah, I played it? in that. That was a really That'd good – That cool. That was a good experience, especially, um, you know, really – getting to know other players that you're playing on um, and meeting other superstars that play the game and just their professionalism. You see what they do behind the scenes. That was a really good experience. And also going out, playing a different game, mm. um, you know, a bit Round of Gaelic, Gaelic footy and Aussie rules. And How'd you kick it? I was okay. Jacko was terrible. <laughs> Glenn Jakovic was our goalkeeper. Can you believe that? Was he? Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Do I have memories? You won't have a goalkeeper, were you? No. You're no. not wasting that. No, time. you couldn't get past Jacko. He, he claimed everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so let's move to 2005. So we know how this ends for the footy club. It's a loss in the grand final. Do, do you remember that that game? Do you, do you remember playing in that game? Yeah, that was that was uh, pretty intense. The old, whole – I mean, we had a brilliant season uh, leading up to that. Even the preparation all through, uh, you know, pre-season was, was – was phenomenal. There was a feeling there that we this group could achieve something. Getting all the way right up to the grand final, it was pretty scary because I tore a hamstring. As you know, I have always had hamstrings, but I lost five games that year at the, uh, uh, the arse end of that year. I uh, kind of got myself ready for the finals, but that getting there against Sydney was um, was one of the greatest memories and feelings that I've had in footy is just being out in the G and having your first experience in grand final days. Because you're so. a Victorian, you're growing up, you watch footy all your life, you're a Hawthorne yeah. fan, they played in a lot of grand finals. Mm. Do, you, do you remember running out on, on the G for grand final Oh, day? yeah, yeah, did you everything. Think, yeah. Did you think, you know, like yeah. how, how good is this? Is that what the feeling is or is it nerve-wracking? Or? Yeah, well, it was nerve-wracking but I wasn't I, – I'm naturally very laid back when it comes to anything, you know. Moments. Pressure like moments like mm. that, I'm very laid back. But I just really took my time. Um, I wanted to – uh, suck in the atmosphere, look at the where my family is sitting, all my mates are sitting, um, and I really that really got me up and about. And I, I knew we all knew playing Sydney is going to be a close one that, that could fall either way. But I felt like I was well prepared that day, and and um, uh, it was a it was, it was a good day. Juddy won the Norm Smith in a losing grand final that day. Do you remember how you played? 
Yeah, he beat me by a vote. Did he? Did you? Yeah, he did. He was second in the well, North Smith? Yeah. I didn't know. I actually wasn't leading you into that. Yeah, were you really? Yeah, so Jacko was coming down preparing to give the, the, give me the news and they changed it halfway down. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Wow. A little, oh, he liked that. Yeah. So Glenn Jakovic was awarding the North Smith medal? No, no, no. He, he did the voting. <clears throat> so uh, he's come down and, he, and just as, as I said, oh, mate, I don't care as long as – one was Joe. Oh, we were too devastated to think about it anyway. Correct. Yeah, so I didn't care less, but that was an interesting one. What's, wow. what's your thoughts on uh, someone from the losing team winning the Norm Smith? Oh, I think it's good, mate. I mean, Buckley's done it in the past. Uh, Juddy, you know, there's uh, Rioli back in 87, I think it was. W- uh, would Judd be the last one? Um, I reckon someone in the uh, – maybe. Yeah, maybe have I to check know. that one. I reckon he might be. Charlie? You're asking me the wrong questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So that's 2005. Um, you come into th- 2006. There's a you know real push from the footy club to go get back there, right? Do, do you remember that that season? Yeah. <clears throat> I remember the feeling, the hunger of the playing group uh, in that preseason was different, and they've gone. Everyone went up a level. <clears throat> I remember. Um, I remember. You know, looking at Tyson Stangline. Uh, Chatty, all of our midfielders, they just really went another level. Brawny was running harder. Brawny, I used to try and train with him on the side and he was just madness. <laughs> but the whole group lift just that little bit more um, and I think we went into that season a lot more confident with um, with our fitness regime. But yeah, People like me who miss a lot of training, I, I was the first time I've been absolutely confident in myself to be, to be available. Mm more regularly. Mm. Um, so that was that was a really big thing for all of us and I think we we're all on the same page then. Gr- grand final week, you're out of the team. You're not in the team coming yeah. into the grand final. Do you remember that? Yeah, that was uh, the two weeks in the week before we jumped on the plane. We had a fitness test. Uh, remember Stewie Cormack? What were you out with? Uh, I had a grade two hamstring. So they Stuart Cormack called me because um, I we had the meeting two weeks out. Yep. And we've all agreed with the coaching staff and Wusha Suma was big on it. I uh, say, oh, we'll just, we'll just rule you out now. And I just said, yes, let's do it because we don't want to muck around. Jamie Graham's playing good footy. Let's just put it to bed now. So on the week before we left, uh, on the Thursday or Friday, we did a, a fitness test and um, – Morsha did a few one-on-ones with me. I've thrown it around and the doc said to me, "If you don't, whatever you do, don't pick the ball up because you, you would just tear it again because I was great too. I was still bleeding. When did you do it? It was a qualifying final. Qualifying final right. against uh, the Bulldogs might have been. Well, um, that's, a, that's a four-week injury. Yeah, right. So this is two weeks after two weeks a four-week after. injury. Yep. yep. So I was bleeding. Um, I did rehab after rehab with Uncle Bill. We knew deep down inside after doing the beach walks and all that at City Beach, I just couldn't even tolerate that. So that's why I I wanted to go and make that call with the coaching staff to say, look, let's just rule it out now. And then uh, Wushi backflipped on me because he did a one-on-one with me after training. And he goes, why don't we just take you over and we make a call over in Melbourne and we do do it the day before Mm. on the Friday. And – for some reason, I somehow got through, but I can still feel it. It's a great to hammy. And uh, the doc says to me, game day, whatever you do, don't think about it. I said, I can't. I think about it. This is like me not thinking that I'm Aboriginal. <laughs> it's fucking there right now. <laughs> and that's what happened. So I had to go into the game and the first – we let the game uh, – let the heat go out. I've come on the inter- uh, from the interchange and there was, the ball's gone down the back line. I'll never forget it. Chicky's there, one-on-one with Mickey O, and I've got Buchanan and the doc goes, whatever you do, we're at, do not slide to ground. First move I do, slide under the ground, go underneath and give it to Chicky. I remember this. And as I stood up, she grabbed. She grabbed. So uh, Stuart Cormack... Uh, no, who was our run? Daniel Metropolis. Yep. <laughs> Metro's come out and he goes, "All right, well done. We need you to we need you to uh, to run uh, with Buchanan, but he's going as a half forward, a high half forward." And I said, "I can't run with him." And then he said the f word, and then come back, and there was no changing then. So Wushy just said, 
All you have to do is stand in front of Barry Hall all day. I don't care what it takes, you have to cut him off. So that was that's all I could do. So I basically played in three-quarter pace and just annoyed the shit out of Barry Hall. So you couldn't run. You did. You had me in the first play of the ground floor. Yeah. Wow. She grabbed straight away. And that's why it was taped up. So Bill Sutherland taped it as hard as he can and he just looked at me and he goes, this is going to do sweet fuck all, <laughs> but it's going to work in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Strap your hammy yeah. to the back of your leg. Yeah. And that was the hardest thing. I'm thinking, I'm trying to convince myself I don't have a hamstring. I don't have a hamstring. I've got no calf muscles. I don't really need muscle. So, yeah, so um, that's, that's what happened. So all I had to do is limp my way through it and it, the worst thing was it was early in the game so I, I just had to kind of hobble around you, you played that, you played that game with the number 22 on your written on your tape mm. oh because I mate as you know if you know Jamie Graham he's one of the most beautiful people that you'll ever meet in your life I I hated taking his spot and he gave me a big kiss and cuddle before it when he got told uh, but if there's one person, if I wish that I couldn't take his spot, that would be Jamie Graham. Because he played every game that year, didn't he? He did. Played uh, the prelim. Played, played, he, mate, he's one of our best players through the final series, but he's a gentleman. And mm. if you know him personally, he's the last person that you want to do anything like that to. So that, that was I, – well, I wanted to write that down just to remind myself, and I, just, I looked at that as soon as I slid on that ground, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So did he, did he have to sort of – I mean, obviously the coach makes the call, but did he put his hand up and say it's it's all good? No, I think it was more the coaching staff pick because um, we have our team meeting and then after that they kind of play their little war games to see different matchups. Um, and in part of that process as well as was trying to push me forward just to um, just to get a bit of run in my legs and that's when I knew that I, I shouldn't have been out there. Yeah. Playing on, um, on Barry Hall – would be pretty intimidating, I assume, because um, I think he he cleaned you up pretty gnarly. Was it earlier that season he gave you that? No, nah, that was that was the 05 grand final. That was, uh, yeah, so right. I've always been on his radar. I mean, <laughs> you always it, it's not an easy job to be the spare man in defence, and I'm only a little bloke. I, I'm not as big as Adam Hunter and all that. I'm only 173 centimeters and 76 kilos. So when you know Barry Hall or Plug a Locker tells you. <laughs> If you're still sitting there, something's going to happen to you. It's pretty intimidating. <laughs> Did you used to talk out in the field? Because like I know you as a oh yeah. Well, that was the only way that I was kind of I felt protected is just by yapping and using <laughs> using your voice. I mean, you got back six. You got to remember that all midfielders and forwards they have about a hundred and hundred and ten meters to make up if they make a mistake. As a backman in the in the back. 50 metres, we, we make a mistake, we have five metres. Yeah. So it's important to, to be yapping and knowing where everyone is. So that's why Glassy and I became very close, as Sheedy used to say, if you can get past the, the bulletproof glass and, the, and his black fly screen, you're doing all right. <laughs> so that was our nickname, can you believe that? <laughs> the bulletproof glass and the black fly screen. <laughs> so that, that, that came from Kevin Sheedy. Yeah. Wow, that's good. So it was important to, to be yapping out there all the didn't, time. Didn't you leave Glassy? Didn't, didn't wasn't there one occasion you didn't quite look after Glassy? Yeah, there was a few occasions <laughs> I didn't look after Glassy, <laughs> and he gave me a mouthful. But he, Glassy's is the last line of defence, so you kind of get caught up playing the game, and Glassy's sitting on the on the on the line there. But he had he, he he's another one who changed his football and turned into one of our greatest leaders yes. at the footy club and, you know, he, I never thought that he would but he did and uh, it was it was a pleasure to play with such great backmen. Mate, you, you had 13 disposals in the 2006 grand final and you're telling me you tore your hamstring in the first one minute of you being on the ground. Yeah, so that how was you, just, How are you, like, it was anyone who hasn't done a hamstring before, you can't you can't play a game of football, let alone a grand final with a torn hamstring. Yeah, well, it was, it, was, it was one of the scariest things I've ever done. You know, it was um, – even now I've got a habit of gra- grabbing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that honestly was the scariest thing that I've ever kind of had to go through in in life really because the pressure of letting everyone down, the pressure of of the game and the heat of it, and it was early. If it was late, you, you can kind of just mm. go and do something stupid, you know, but you just – I just had to be smart and – kind of hobble around um, and disguise it. And I, I couldn't let um, Buchanan 
uh, know as well because they, w- they would have just kept running and let everyone know. Yeah, wow. I remember uh, Jet Boy, one of our good mates, Lewis Jetta, came up to me about th- halfway through the third quarter in the 2018 grand final <laughs> and he, s- he said, uh, I said, hey, yeah, mate, or something like that, you know. It was, it was in the heat of battle, right? It wouldn't have been a nice chat. It would have been like, mate, you're right, you're right. He's like, done both my calves. <laughs> so what do you mean? He's like, oh, I come in, one of my calves was done, but I've done the other one. I've got two, 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 two torn calves. <laughs> and he, he did. Jets had done both his calves in the 2018 grand final and he was running around. Oh, yeah. You bloke, be, seriously. Must be the blackness well, coming you, out you blokes have got no calves in there. I know, to mate, do. That's what, I think you just mate, buy skin uh, and bones. It, it is. And the funny thing is, and you can check out with the medical staff there, is that when I went to go and get um, my scans, on my when because I, I tore a calf during that year, it was only a, a little grade one, so I was able to play with it. Yes. Um, and uh, when Rod Moore looked at it, he goes, "Your calf muscles, the natural ones, are like that." He goes, "You've got an extra muscle, and that extends to your hamstring, which gave you the opportunity to jog." Right. Yeah. So that's that's a medical fact. So you're, so you're running with. So your I said, calf. you're saying that I've got th- three muscles in a calf muscle. He goes, just a little one, but it's enough that it extends up. To well, the, that's the torpedo length. Must be. So <laughs> yeah. probably uh, that might be. I don't know if, if we uh, we're still evolving into humans. I don't know, but we're still. Uh, that's a, that's a medical fact. You can ask uh, Rod Moore on that. Any wow. any any memories of celebrations or. Um, <laughs> Times after winning that flag, what's it like winning that that premiership after well, losing the year you, before? You should know. I'm still, you know, still haven't paid for a meal yet in Perth, so I'm <laughs> enjoying that fact. Uh, no, it was it was the best feeling. I mean, the best feeling for me, honestly, was was the time that I spent away from my family to chase this dream that they know that I've been chasing, and then share that with them. Was, was pretty special and then come back with your teammates and say, well, we have something that no one can take away from us for the rest of our lives and that's that's got to be an ongoing life celebration. Mm. We, we are now premiership players and that's something I'm proud to say about yourself, mate. It gives you that bond that you've got forever. What was it like watching 18 from, you know, the, the last premiership at the footy club? What, what did you buy? Oh, oh, I've, I've never been so proud in my life, especially being up there and to be a genuine supporter. Like, I lost my shit. <laughs> like I, now I know when I look at that idiot over there screaming and carry on with his beer and throwing his pie at people, that's, that was me. <laughs> Were you at the game? I was there. You know, and I couldn't wait to – because all my family are Collingwood. Oh, there was nothing better, <laughs> you know. So that was – that was – that was to me showed that I absolutely love this club and I still love my footy. But that was the first time I actually felt like a genuine supporter. Yeah. Yeah, just a, a football supporter. Yes. Because I've never – when you understand the inner sanctum of a club and you know all you blokes and you, you watch – you still feel like you're in there, but when you're actually out there, I did not give a fuck that day. <laughs> I was an eagle and I was carrying on like every other dickhead <laughs> and I forgot about how I was presenting myself. <laughs> so I I loved it. That's great. That's great. Do you, um, do you still like enjoy watching a lot of footy? Do you, do you make time for that or is it something that um, – I don't know. I guess when it's your job for so long – I don't know if it's something that you enjoyed. No, I, I seeped away from it for a long time, um, you know, because I, I I was all footy footied out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm kind of getting back into it now. I'm starting to enjoy it a lot more now, um, and I still do a lot with West Coast behind the scenes. So it gives me an opportunity to watch the boys' development, uh, and and that's what I love watching these new players coming through the system and and having a chat with them more socially, and also the girls being a part of that and seeing them and. Um, that, that it's it's just me getting back into the, into the Eagles again and back into footy again. So because I've been out for about honestly probably about five years where mm. I rarely watched it. The We're Up Under Foundation. You started that while you were playing. You know, doing that while you're playing, and then the work you've done throughout. Um, it's a, it's a pretty big legacy that you've left, not just as a footballer but as a person. Yeah, it was it was important for me to, um, I suppose create an opportunity for me after football and this is something that I always wanted to say to these young blokes don't always put your life on a ball because you might not be good enough to get it 
because the average lifespan for an AFL footballer is three and a half years. So if you haven't got no qualifications, you know what you'll be doing. You'll be standing outside lining up like every other person. So you just can't take a TW share into, to a company and say, why don't you employ me because I'm very good at chasing this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what they can tell you? They can tell you, you know, what you do with that cricket ball and ram it up your ass. <laughs> Go and stand in line. Uh, so I had, to create, I had to create a legacy and also a job pathway for myself to be able to have an income uh, for, for, uh, for life after footy. Now that, that phase is finished now because it led me into other opportunities um, and that foundation was something important that I wanted to utilise while I was playing footy, utilising West Coast as a vehicle to be able to assist people's lives, go to disadvantaged places, communities, not only Indigenous but everyone, was, was something that I wanted to do because it was my passion in doing that. So now that that was, that was 20 years ago, the foundation now has changed over to the Wallach, still got a very strong subsidiary to West Coast Eagles and now David Werripunda has gone off and done his own thing now. So I'm now, you know, a manufacturer of cleaning supplies all around Australia. So that's given me an opportunity to continue on my other stuff and still support the foundation through training and employment and uh, continue on to do my own life. But if I didn't do that, I would have ended up in Shepparton picking peaches <laughs> fighting on with my cousins and uh, struggling to buy a beer. What about – couldn't you have um, – couldn't you have been a dancer? Yeah, look, if you want to go there, mate, jeez. <laughs> I think we do. I, uh, we absolutely well, do, mate. All right, well – Talk us through Dancing with the Stars. Probably the worst thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but be- because I was like you, go, I thought, I want to stay in the media. I need to keep my name going in the lights. There you go. Hang on, I'm not doing Dancing with the Stars <laughs> oh, yet. Mate, yet. So, yet. Yet. <laughs> yes, well, let's not talk too soon. But I was sitting down with the producers over here in Perth after the fifth bottle of Pepper Jack Shiraz <laughs> – Bottle. I said, mate, of course I can dance. I'll get out there and show everyone how to do it. And Pepper the, Jack, one of the fine drops. Yeah, yeah. fine, cheap one. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's the way it happened. So I woke up with a contract uh, and I said, yep, I'm doing it. And oh I want to get into media. I want to get into Melbourne. I want to do Dead Set Legends. And then I had to go out there and it looked like the lady was dragging a scarecrow around the <laughs> <me, laughs> room. But there's an interesting story in that because I, I thought I've got to keep the word Punda name going. Yes. Especially that I'm the only person who danced for my own charity, raises enough money, kept the programs going. All I had to do was go and make a fucking idiot of myself on <laughs> national TV. So I did that. Yeah. So I, when I went on there, the problem was I had a game plan to go, okay, I do two shows and then I get voted off and I go home. Yeah. I was on there for three months. <laughs> Three months, can you believe that? Well, they kept voting you off. No, they wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> so by the third month, I said, Am I let us swear? Yeah. yeah. You know, so Georgie of Arms, good mate of mine, you know, packed to the rafters and, I, and Georgie and I, we're sitting down having a beer and I said, fuck this, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. He goes, you can't, you're contracted. I said, fucking mate, I'll show you. <laughs> Too confident. So we're sitting there, had a beer at the Crown and I said, I'm fucking getting off this, mate. This is ridiculous. We're making <laughs> idiots of ourselves, man. <laughs> anyway, so he goes, you can't. I said, you watch me. I'm walking off tonight's show. He goes, you won't worry. You haven't got the balls. I said, mate, I ain't been doing contracts all my life and I'll do this one tonight. So we're all standing up. We're all standing up, live television, because it's live television. You, there's no fucking around. You can't get out of it. It's not made up. <laughs> And then I said, oh, yeah, excuse me. Um, this is on TV. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And I said, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I think I should give up my shot, uh, spot. I'm going to walk off. I want George Avadis to have the votes. And he's sitting in the background because <laughs> Pact of the Rafters was supposed to go on this big uh, tour for right. free on some magnetic island, I think it was. <laughs> and he's sitting there going, in the background, where are you? are a fucking asshole. <laughs> And I said, shut your Greek mouth. I said, I'm, I've had enough. Anyway, so I walked off on national TV. Afterwards, we've all gone out to dinner and the production company all sitting there. And they've gone, fuck, mate, no one's done that before on live television. And I'm sitting there going, can't wait to go back to Perth. I've got enough fucking dramas as it is. Uh, I'll see you later. And they go, we're glad you left. Anyways, we're I said, yeah, same as me. I'm glad. They go, no, we're really glad because you're costing us money. What? Exactly. I said, how am I costing you money? He goes, because it's live television, every second Thursday, every black fellow in Australia will reverse charge calling. <laughs> Off of voting. Yes, and, be- <laughs> and because it's discrimination if they don't answer it. 
So they were, it was costing the production company money because they were reverse charge oh, calling. Bullshit. That, that, that can't, can't be true. Bullshit. Mate, I'm telling you. <laughs> and I said, where was the condensity of the votes? He goes, Western Australia, Northern Territory and Victoria. I said, yeah, probably all my first cousins. <laughs> That's, oh, you know that what? If, you, if that was to happen today on TV, it would go viral. It would be like the biggest thing that ever happened to the TV show. Oh, we're going to find oh, the footage of oh, yeah, mate, just going, hey, excuse, yeah, me, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I want yeah. George to stitch up yeah. George. <laughs> Hey, I'm telling you, we'll get George on the show here one day and he'll walk you through the whole scenario and uh, I'll show you the footage. I've got it at home. I'll give it to you. And um, and he's swearing in the background. You can see his lips just running me down. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I think, we got, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anymore? Anymore? No, that's good. That's good. All right, Wiz. That's the end from Dan and I, all right? Back chat powered by Fleet Network. But we do have one final piece Scotial media, not social, scotial. Oh, I thought you might like that. I do, I it's, do. It's, I'm uh, impressed. Yeah, correct. <laughs> no, no, it's me, me, very impressed. <laughs> this is where the people get to ask you the questions. So Dan and I have written all those, but <clears> these <throat> ones are from the people, for the people, yep. for David Weirapunda. So scotial media, let's get into it. We'll finish with the first sure. one. Sure. Jado25. Uh, uh, yeah, Shane, Shane Haddo. Yeah, uh, looking back at the 05, 07 team now, should have we won more than one flag? We should have won three. Mm. In those three go. years? In a row. Really? We lost Cuzzy with that bad hamstring after losing your Port Adelaide over in Adelaide. We had that momentum going, but we had a few hiccups off the field, which kind of I didn't I wouldn't say it I wouldn't say it interrupted us as a team, but it did as a club. There was noise, right? It was outside noise. Um uh Talis Dawson. No. Uh, bloody Pont. Okay. Uh, who's the greatest teammate you played with? The greatest teammate? Oh, geez, you're splitting hairs there. But as far as someone that really had a lot to do with me is uh, Peter Matera. There you go. Good. T underscore Dizzy. Uh, hey, we're, uh, you were referenced in the rap song Jimmy Ricard by Draft. Just Jay. wondering if you've heard the track and what your reaction was. Uh, when you heard it, Jay, yeah, uh, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Ricard, Ricard. Yeah. we were up under on the ball. Yeah, uh, that you don't was, sound like you like it. No, no, I, I love it. I, well, what happened was when they first brought that out, they came to the club to ask permission to use my name. I didn't think nothing of it. So, Cuzzy and I were in the weights room one day, and they come on, and I've gone, oh, "That's those lo- blokes." And then once the song came out, it was just, I like it. Yeah, so it kind of got stuck. Very good. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything for us here. Hayden Ratcliffe? Uh, best party story from the mid-2000s that hasn't been spoken about previously. Oh, geez, I don't know if we can go there. <laughs> A lot of it's got to do with Michael Braun and he's terrible. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's no, that's very good. good. Maybe something for our patrons a little later on. Yeah. Uh, Riley.edge. What did Darren Glass say when calling David back with the flight against Collingwood when Anthony Rocker cleaned him up? He just kept calling me back, you're in, you're in, you're in. The last minute he said, you're in trouble. <laughs> and I woke up on the ground with um, Anthony Rocker's knee at my ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter underscore Pistorius. Um, I watched your first game against North Melbourne at Subiaco Oval. Tell us your memories of that day. Uh, it was nerve wracking, um, but exciting at the same time. I just remember thinking, geez, a few weeks ago I was back home in Hillsville having a kick with my mates and walking around uh, Eastland Shopping Centre, and now I'm chasing <laughs> around uh, Anthony Kudafidis. And yeah, that was a bit of a spin out. Jamie underscore Hall underscore music. Uh, so, first part, not a question, but a memory I'd like to share. One of uh, the most visceral memories of my childhood involved a young me and my dad being behind the goal square. A very young Weera had just snapped a goal. My dad's face lit up. We're up under, he exclaimed. I'm not sure I've ever seen my dad happier um, than at that moment. That's amazing. It's a pretty cool moment. Well, that's that's good to know that I've uh, put a smile on some dad's face. <laughs> I wish I could do that to mine. <laughs> uh, question, uh, what makes you prouder? The impact you had on the field or the impact you've had on your community? I'm not sure there are many names more synonymous with the continued cultural growth and prosperity of the Indigenous community. Uh, I, I think... I think I'm probably more proud internally with the footy club and my footy. I mean, that's something with that I do with community is is probably a life a life uh, lifestyle thing for me. So it's I don't see it like that. Mm. But with the footy thing, it's it was that phase of my life that I probably most enjoyed the the most. Mm. We are flag mantle. Uh, current eagle you'd most like to have a beer with? 
Um, probably Govs. Mm. I haven't had a chance to have a, have a beer with the big fella yet. Oh, so, I think he'd enjoy the return. Sure, yeah. He probably might have a bit of time now. He's ripped his hammy off. Yeah, the I know. Well, my hammy's still stuffed, so <laughs> Maybe you put yours not, in there. Not not as bad as mine, but yeah, but the big gov. I'd love to um, have a beer well, with. What about the current number forty four? He's going all right. No, along. Yeah, well, I only found out. You know, I don't mind him wearing forty four now because I just found out he's an Achuca boy. And, oh, right. uh, you know, that's my country. So, and he's got a bit of toe about him as well. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's playing at the wrong end, but that's okay. He's got, he's clean skilled. He's, he's smart. He does the right thing. He's a very good bloke by all, all means. Yeah, so I no, think that's look, good. Looking good. forward to, uh, meeting him as well. Very good. I reckon we should sort a couple of these out, Dan. Yeah, we'll do. Um, Matt Cutback. Uh, who's the most underrated teammate and who from your era should Backchat have on as a guest? Oh, uh, Rowan Jones. You want yeah. Jonesy on here as well? I want Jonesy on here. Okay, yep. very good. Great. Kobe, uh, Kobe. Row. Uh, did you have any pre-game uh, superstitions or rituals? Yeah, lay on the bench and just have a little snooze. <laughs> <laughs> Before a game. Before a game. You used to do that, didn't you? Yeah, I used to love uh, Uncle, just Billy Sutherland. Anyway. Uncle Billy Sutherland. He'd rub me down and I would just have a little, little snooze. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh... Last one, the egg man. How does the legendary number 44 wear a like his eggs cooked? Um, sunny side up. Fried. Oh, very good. good. Uh, Wiz, have you had fun, mate? Oh, I've loved it. We've yeah, enjoyed I, having I you. I actually don't want to go home. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you can't stay here, mate. You've got to go home. <laughs> I've got a few cousins coming over. Is that all right? <laughs> we've got a few, we can have you, mate. We've, we've loved having you on back chat. Thank you for your time. Um, Backchat double underscores our socials. That's where you can find all the good stuff there. Backchatpodcast.com.au. Sign up as a Patreon, as a patron on Patreon. Yep. Yes, I'll get that right one day. You can be a VIP and get some of the stuff. We're just going to tell one more story for those VIPs mm-hmm. later after this. A big thanks to Fleet Network. Backchat, of course, powered by Fleet Network for 2023. Swimply, Whippersnapper Whiskey, Margaret River Roasting Co., Blue Bet, Shelter Brewing Co., and of course, Little Cameras. Very good. I don't think I missed anything. No. Thanks very much, mate. Pleasure.